This is a free zone composite lecture, restored for completeness. In this, the first lecture given on his return from South Africa, Ron relates his experiences in Rhodesia. Let's see what this is. <laughs> A booby trap. <laughs> Break in there. Oh man, look at look at the death set. A nice beautiful lighter. Take the red thing off the top. Put it out. Yeah. <laughs> beautiful cigarette box. Lovely. And a nice ice tray. Nice. Great. Great. Anything more? <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's enough. I, I read it. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate it. Most of all, I just appreciate being home, just period. <laughs> How's your sound? All right. Well, uh, might as well sit down here. It's not a formal lecture. Today I'm going to tell you something about the Adventures of Somebody, this is what, July the 19th, A.D. 16, uh, the year of the Clares, that's for sure. I'm going to tell you today about the adventures of somebody who went out barefooted to take a country. <laughs> About uh, February, why uh, I was holding the mock up together with Sticky Plaster, and uh, the organization was running, was running just fine. Everything was going along all right. Technology was all wrapped up. I knew it was wrapped up. But I thought I'd better put it all on weight. So I put several things on weight. Put my own case on weight in case I needed it to find out why they couldn't make it. I've done this time and time again for years. I get up to a certain <laughs> level, and then I'll stand around and wait for somebody to catch up, you know. <laughs> and uh, the seven division system was in organizationally. And so I decided why I would take a short vacation. So I went down to Las Palmas, and I was down there for about 30 days. And while I was down there, I kept an eye open, see what was going on. Organizations seemed to be running all right. And then all of a sudden, you made clear one, John McMaster. So I said, great, but will there be clear two? Well, I said, that's good enough. I have no reason to sit around here in Las Palmas waiting for clear two. And no reason to sit around here waiting endlessly to find out what on earth uh, can happen in a seven divisional system, whether they go up or down. I'll go on down to South Africa and uh, get into some mischief. <laughs> I didn't have a very well-conceived plan about it, but actually what I wanted to do was to uh, find and found and locate uh, an alternate uh, base or OT base. I couldn't quite figure out why I couldn't do this. I'll tell you why I couldn't do this in a minute or two. So I went down and I uh, stopped off in Rhodesia. But en route to Rhodesia, it suddenly occurred to me that there was a type and principle of constitution that would get them off the hook. 
as a country and solve some of their problems. So I decided I would write this up, which I did in some notes. And when I got there, I got it typed up. And I handed it over to the government, and the government seemed to be very happy about it. It was quite an incidental gesture. I said, well, let's, uh, let's see if we can't do something in this direction all by ourselves. And uh, I got to looking around the place. Suddenly remembered I had some assets and some stuff in southern Africa, so I decided I would go into a bit of investment. I'd pull out another hat. See, I can always locate money for some peculiar reason. <laughs> and this baffles income tax, by the way, but it's explained very easily. You don't make money. You just have it. <laughs> you want to learn that someday. You just have money. Don't bother me. So anyway, I... Uh, minding my own business, more or less, and I decided I'd rent a house, and then the next thing you know, I found out I could buy this house very cheaply, so I bought it. Some guy came tearing up the drive one day and told me that I could buy a hotel that was entirely surrounded by elephants on Lake Kariba, which was going very cheap indeed. It's about an 80,000-pound hotel, and we could buy it for about 5,500. So I bought that. I wrote him a check. <laughs> And uh, then later on, I uh, noticed a farm, of course, a nice farm, so I got the farm and so on. But what I was watching here during this whole time, what I was watching was simply the economics and behavior of the wog world. Now, you know, I've been kind of gone from the wog world for a long time. I've been spoiled. I've had you for friends. And, uh, it's different. <laughs> and I, in actual fact, was getting a kick out of being out there cheek by jowl with, uh, just the log world. I found out I had lots of friends. Could make lots of friends. And, uh, the guys that I made friends with were pretty tough characters in their own right. I normally find it very easy to make friends with very tough characters. You know. uh, I don't mean by that low-grade social characters. I mean just savage-type characters that uh, haven't reformed, you know, unreformed-type people. And uh, there's a lot of those in Rhodesia. And uh, I was getting along just fine. It's a wonderful uh, area, a lot of sociality. They have what's called sundowners. And about, uh, well, from any time from 5.30 on, why people start dropping in, or you start dropping in. And uh, they have some drinks and that sort of thing, and then they go home. And uh, it's typical, typical 19th century English, you know. Uh, Victorian in the extreme. Because you don't, you don't have, have dinner without putting at least a dark suit on. They come off the tuxedo. You know, the Englishman used to out in the bush. You know, out in the bush, you see, in the old days, why he'd take off his, uh, he'd take off his sun helmet and uh, his wuss jacket and his shorts, and he would get into a tuxedo all by himself, you see, way out in the bush. <laughs> True. And uh, sit down at a fancily spread uh, dinner, elegantly served, don't you? And he didn't want to lose contact with socialist civilization, so he would make it. So anyhow, that's still hanging on in Rhodesia. Very interesting country. It's a totally sophisticated civilization sitting as a small jewel in the midst of a howling wilderness. You go any direction, very far, and you start running into elephants, buffalo, lion, and the lot, you see. But uh, those sports cars and uh, uh, chromium-plated girls and... <laughs> so on a bound inside the tiny perimeters of the areas that are civilized, very sophisticated, far far more modern than London. It provides some fantastic contrasts. So anyway, this civilization, of course, is an interesting civilization to look at, but it's more practical than that. 
because it's got an area, I don't know how many times the size of what country, that uh, really isn't growing anything. The thing is full of minerals, and uh, uh, there's five-mile mountain of Cromore down there that they haven't even begun to dig, dig up. And uh, there's gold, and there's everything else you can think of there, but mainly there is enough land and uh, uh, enough uh, range and so on to feed probably Europe and most of it untouched by the plow. Beautiful climate and so on. Here is a, here is a brand new country that hasn't been run downhill yet and could afford a great deal of development. Well, I went ahead, went to work on this, kept in touch with the government. I met all the ministers and talked to them, had sundowners with them, and met the prime minister and all that. And, uh, uh, had tea with his wife, and you know, that kind of thing. And uh, I was a very acceptable bloke, I assure you. Very acceptable. I didn't say one single word about Scientology. Every time anybody would ask me about Scientology, well, I would just brush it off and not say anything about it. Most of the time. I'd define the word for them or something like that, and then go on talking about cows or gold mines or something like that. <laughs> Well, I probably was giving them a whole dose of no auditing in actual fact. <laughs> but uh, I was purposely and with malice of forethought examining the log world. And I didn't want to unwog anybody. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, television found me, and I went on television. Radio found me, and I started going on the radio. You know me. I see some situation or problem or something like that to be solved. I go ahead and solve it. You know. But by George, you know, I didn't have any authority. I didn't have any authority. I couldn't put out a sick head. <laughs> and by actual sober calculation, no, no joking about it, I could have had them off the launching pad uh, in about three weeks. I could have gotten rid of their sanctions, got rid of their poverty, and got a white population, gotten the money. This, this bang, bang, bang was too easy. Don't you know? Well, although, although I didn't, <laughs> although. I wasn't giving them any auditing. I was awful near clear. And the unreality of the fact that one could uh, actually resolve this situation that has staggered the greatest minds on the planet, don't you think? I say that advisedly, minds. <laughs> <laughs> Left some rather baffled, but what was very interesting was that each Rhodesian, knowing what I was advising them to do, would himself agree with it, flat out, and let's do it tomorrow. But he would caution me that the ideas were too far advanced for any other Rhodesian to accept. <laughs> <laughs> and this was 100% sweet, so that included all the Rhodesians. Well, time ground on, and uh, I got in transport right into Lake Kariba. It's the first time anybody had ever gone down to the southern shore of Lake Kariba with any kind of transport. And I got four-wheel drive Land Rovers, two tonners, and started throwing them in there to supply the hotel. And they ran along, called the Boomy Express. <laughs> and uh, uh, it ran along through the lions and water, and through the buffalo and the elephants and so forth. Boomy, hasn't, Boomy Hotel has an airstrip. It's mostly an air hotel. And uh, they actually have to buzz the hotel every now and then to get the elephants off the runway. <laughs> and it sits right there on Lake Kariba, which is a huge lake very beautiful setting. But uh, you can sit on the porch of the thing and drink a Tom Collins, you know, and watch the elephants and buffalo and so forth walking around very close by, sometimes too close by, because they're all very wild animals. They're not even game park tame, you know. <laughs> and uh, baboons coming up, thumbing their noses at you and tearing the thatch off the roof, you know, and raising it down. But I got the Boomy Express going. And it left every Wednesday and came back every Thursday. And a fellow by the name of Samson drove it. And he was an old Kariba truck driver. Samson, he's 
black fella, and he, he didn't quite fit into the scene as a domestic chauffeur. He did not have the tact or polish that my proper number one driver, Frank, had. But uh, as soon as I turned him loose with the Boomy Express while he was in his element, I gave him a carboy to help him out, and man, he would take that Boomy Express out of Salisbury and burn the road, and then he'd turn off at, at Karoy and go thundering through the, the, the swamps and jungles and dongas and so on, and wind up at Boomy and turn it around and come back again. First time they'd ever had any transport in there. We, we, we couldn't put our hotel transport on it anymore. We were filled up with freight. <laughs> and industry started blossoming. After all, there are 30,000 Batankas, uh, natives right there in the vicinity of the hotel, and they fish in the lake, and there's no way to get their cargoes out of them. And uh, economy started to spark. And elsewhere it started to spark. I did some various other things. I got a furniture factory started, and, and uh, odds and ends. <laughs> and the statistic of Rhodesia started to rise. Business started picking up. Now, it was sort of on the basis. They'd look at me on TV, and they would say, well, he thinks the country's all right, so there must be something right about it, you know. And then get busy instead of sitting and moping. You get the idea. I mean, that was all it took. It wasn't any encouragement of the ideas themselves. But just the fact that somebody would come in and be interested and so on, where they thought everybody would be running and disinterested, made, made a bit of a difference. Well, the uh, adventures were many. And uh, time ground on. And I began to wonder how on earth Am I going to get back to St. Hill? Because to walk off at this stage of the game, would have been very discreditable in the eyes of the Rhodesian. I, they couldn't have explained how I could possibly have walked off, do you think? So how to walk off? That was the main problem. Because, of course, I didn't intend this as a total profession. I would have kept it going very nicely. But how to bow gracefully out of this picture? I was woven too tightly into it, you think. And I wasn't woven into it just with the white Rhodesian. Now, all kinds of weird things had been going on. I had a staff. Actually, I employed about 38 Africans, uh, coloreds, and Europeans. And uh, my own staff, I had a staff of about nine. And they were the pick of all the counselor staffs. You see, the various nations helped Rhodesia uh, by kicking the African in the teeth. And when their consuls and missions left after the Declaration of Independence, of course, they just callously sacked all their staffs you know, and pulled out. And they just left the town mobbed with their the highest order of domestic uh, Africans. And uh, I sorted them out one after the other and picked out the best ones. And wound up with a staff, as I say, of about nine. But uh, the Rhodesian was always very helpful. He was always telling me how to handle the African. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it was quite, quite remarkable. Quite remarkable. The advice was very sound. Very sound. At least it made sound. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, I began to realize they didn't know anything about Africans. True, they didn't. Because they didn't know this about Africans, simply that Africans are people. Do you follow? They respond to Scientology formulas, just like any other people. And people don't have peculiarities, but if you don't know Scientology, then people could look awfully peculiar to you. <laughs> they say these boys go sullen on you, and you have to be very careful, and you have to watch them very carefully, because they'd go sullen. They'd go outside and stand around and be very, very sullen, and uh, you have to watch for this sign and symptom. Well, they, Rudin, white Rudin is very helpful with this. I found out why they went sullen. After they'd been told to do something they couldn't do, and then cross-confused, the H.C. was all mixed up, and then they were balled out, they went sullen. <laughs> now, of course, there are two errors being made with regard to the African. One is to take a bird who does not have any background 
uh, educational or experiential background immediately that has anything to do with politics, economic statesmanship, and all that sort of thing. They've, they've gotten out of this line, you see, if they were ever in it. And uh, we can't instantly take one of these boys and uh, say, all right, you are now an expert economist, run the country, because he's immediately overwhelmed and baffled because he isn't able to do it any more than an English laborer out here. You walk up to him and say, you're prime minister now. Very often he'll take it and start shooting other laborers or something. <laughs> but uh, I see parents Scientologically. Every now and then I see Scientological uh, families where the baby has just learned to crawl and the parents are sort of uh, nagging at it because it isn't walking you think. And they fail to acknowledge what the baby can do. And you'll find a very unhappy baby after a while. Little kids, you know, you know, why aren't you clear? It's the same type of invalidation, you know. The bird's trying, he's coming up the line, and you try to push him too fast. Overrun it, in other words. Get it up there. Overexpect, you see. And you start overexpecting, and uh, the fellow has not been trained as an electrician. Well, let's not knock his block off because he now cannot fix electrical contacts, and it's just stupid, you see. But on the one side, why part of the world is saying these men are totally educated, completely grooved in, and should therefore be able to take over all the concerns that any other society has. And on the, the Southern African side, why they say these fellows are too stupid to live and can't learn anything. You see, somewhere in between here, there's some truth about the situation, but it's just truth about this. Well, recognizing that fact, my boys were very, very happy boys. I, I denationalized and renationalized them, which was one of the reasons their morale was good. I told them they weren't Rhodesians anymore, they were Americans. <laughs> <laughs> and this was highly acceptable to them. <laughs> well, when they first started the work, they were a bit lean. They were a bit thin. And uh, when I left, they were very fat. They're very fat. And, uh, of course, their uniforms were spotless and they had lots of them, you see, and they, they, they really looked very snap and polished. Any guest coming into the yard was practically overwhelmed by car boys and things opening doors, you know, and shoving drinks in their hand and all that sort of thing. <laughs> but they served with great enthusiasm. <laughs> and, uh, they, those, those people sure can work. The Africans sure can work. That's one thing nobody has ever quite noticed about them. They are very hard-working people. And uh, after a while, these Africans, drifting around their own townships, going out for an afternoon off and having boys in on their own, you see. You know, the African has, has he's, he's a very interesting character. But he has flaws, just like uh, just like whites do, you know. And he has good points, you know. I used to tell Jambo, the number one boy, I'd say, "Well, you're a very uh, this 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 almost killed him, uh, because uh, always before he'd just been scolded and nagged at about this. I'd say you're a very good boy, in spite of the fact that you smoke daca, drink, and gamble." <laughs> and of course, he never expected anybody to really know that he smoked daca, drank, and gambled. But he ran practically a gambling establishment out in the boys' huts uh, every night, and boys were in there from far and wide. Terrific communication line. <laughs> and these boys kept telling other boys that there was uh, 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 Mr. Hubbard here, who was an American who was building everything up and he actually believed in everybody getting a break and that the country was now going to amount to something, you know. And you know how they could blow this sort of thing up. I, they really can blow one up. I gave one of the, I gave the chef one day a note one night when it was very late so the police stopped him why they wouldn't uh, chop his head off. And the note simply said that if he was stopped, and if there was anything wrong, to call me at once. And I gave my phone number. He showed this all over the town. <laughs> <laughs> Only his interpretation of it was, as you see, 
De master tell the police what to do. <laughs> so I eventually, in this short period of about four months, achieved the rather fantastic position of being very acceptable to uh, the various races. Uh, and this was very peculiar. This is pan-determinism, of course, one's looking at. And more importantly, the moderate white and the extreme right white could also agree on what I was saying. One night I was listening to a replay of a radio program and there was one of the ex extreme, extreme, extreme white supremacy boys sitting in the room. And there was one of the very, very, very moderate individuals, you know, everybody should have a vote tomorrow without any limits of any kind. And after that program, why the extreme moderate said almost in chorus, with the extreme right man. Uh, now, if we could convince the other people to follow that, we'd all be home and dry. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic rent of agreement. So this, this was all very pleasant and so on. I do not say at this time that certain elements in the area were not becoming slightly green-eyed. Now, about the fourth or fifth time somebody says to you that you ought to be PM, you know very well they've said it to the PM. <laughs> they've said, you know, why don't you take this fellow Hubbard's advice on this sort of thing? Or, more maliciously, maybe he's pitching for your job. <laughs> After all, it's a very tiny community. There are only 270,000 whites in the whole country. And I don't know, any day of the week we got more Scientologists than that, you see. So this is actually a down statistic on people. <laughs> but look at this. Look at this. Tiny community. Only 30,000 taxpayers in the country pay all the taxes. And uh, with modern communication, this all became very simple and very easy. Of course, I didn't have anything in mind but trying to build it up, break the deadlock a little bit, and uh, having bought property and so forth, why then be able to operate it because it'd be money for me. <clears throat> well, that was the entirety of the game. And all the time I had my eye open on what was going on and what this was all about in the wild world. And I found out an awful lot, naturally, because this was an actual fact I'm not trying to give you an exaggerated idea of my importance in Rhodesia, although the Rhodesian Herald just put a call through just a little while ago to find out when I was coming back to Rhodesia and uh, so forth. A very, very pleasant query, you know. They, they think I'm great now because the Smith regime doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it worked out like this. A uh, Peter... Young husband, a reporter of the London Daily Mail, and part of this uh, uh, conspiracy that's going on on the newspaper proprietor associates, or whatever they call themselves, or the mafia, or whatever it is. <laughs> uh, this outfit considered all this sufficiently important to send one of their reporters, Peter Young husband, down to get next to their minister of information to tell her minister of information what a terribly bad fellow I was, he instantly, without checking his facts of any kind whatsoever, turned around and gave Smith a story about what a terribly bad fellow I was, who turned around and gave the cabinet the same story, and the next morning, when the Rhodesian Front Committee heard about this and charged down flat-footedly, you know, bang, what the devil is this, when they heard that Hubbard was not going to have his visa extended. Unfortunately for Smith, he was talking to a group who knew that every word he was saying was a lie. Smith, in March, was known to be too fair and too honest. Direct quote. He'd been built up as a god. His popularity had begun to, begun to decline because he hadn't led them to the, to the wonderland, you see. He'd led them deeper in the swamp. But more importantly, he had begun to read speeches by this fellow Howman. Instead of doing an ad lib on TV, why well, began to read speeches on TV, and then he stopped even appearing on TV. Well, he stood there and told this, this group that this action was being taken against Hubbard, 
because his business associates were complaining about him. He overlooked the fact that I only had three business associates, and he was talking to one of them there in the committee. <laughs> <laughs> and all of them were trying to knock the government's doors down with rocks because they considered this action completely irrational. That was lie one. Then he told them that I'd been deported from Australia. A glance at my passports, and I had my canceled passports with me, demonstrated no such action and no modern visa of any kind whatsoever for Australia. No stamp of entry. And then he said that uh, I was wanted all over the place and had a record. <laughs> and these people knew that my credit was in the stars all over the world. People whose credit is in the stars don't have records. And they sat there in shocked horror and looked at those clay feet. That God sure had clay feet. He was not fair at all. He hadn't inquired into his evidence. And they knew that either he or somebody else was being very dishonest. And they walked out. And now sweepingly through the Rhodesian front, they're talking about the replacement of Smith. He shouldn't have done it. <laughs> now, Howman was exposed, as they very often suspected, of being sympathetic toward the left wing. And it suddenly occurred to them that uh, Howman, in many instances, had dismissed anybody who had fought <coughs> communists in that government. These were such people as Ivor Benson, a fellow named Hasker, Nigel Bruce Hankey. The, these were people that uh, had been in his ministry and had been quite able in deterring communism from getting into the government. And he had sacked every one of them. Now that he had pulled a long bow like this and had listened to a newspaper reporter from London, an English newspaper reporter could bring influence on the Rhodesian government. I wouldn't give much for his life. He'd let her run into a bullet. You see? The situation, then, is pretty well unsettled. <laughs> and Larry Houts, an American who's been there for about 13 years, said, well, it's all right for you to leave now, because when you walk back in here, you'll walk back in as a hero. It couldn't have been arranged. It couldn't have been stage managed better. <laughs> and so I could come back to St. Hill. <laughs> now, after an adventure of that particular kind, uh, it makes one wonder why one doesn't try a funding operation or financing and so forth of the British government. Or, uh, <laughs> take it on that low, or you should be able to take it on that high, but it looks like a slightly steep gradient to me. For instance, the Bank of England had to put out 25 million pounds just yesterday to stabilize the pound and so forth, and I probably couldn't dig up that more money than would take, take them a couple of hours. It would just stabilize the pound for two hours, and I don't think that's long enough. <laughs> I've been looking this over, and I don't think that our logical next step is to assist the British government financially or otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I now know what I was trying to locate and call OT base. That was the first thing that uh, my problem was. Where and what is OT base? Where and what is this thing? After I'd been going for a while, I found out, much to my amazement, that you cannot locate a base you do not know the purpose of. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know the purpose of it. <laughs> Naval base, you see, that would be on the sea. An air base, you know, that would be on 
<laughs> there's some airfield, flat country, and uh, an army base. That might be most any place. But they all have different purposes. A hospital base would be a place where you could get in and out ambulances and so on. <laughs> But uh, in order to locate a base, you have to know what it's supposed to do. <laughs> and I know that sounds terribly elementary and often very stupid, but the great mistakes are made in life by not getting answers to stupid questions. <laughs> so I now know what uh, OT base has got to do. And the first thing it's got to do is put in ethics on a planetary level. Because if we put in ethics, we can then get in technology. And your worries right now, as you associate with the public in general, and try to tell them about Scientology, are totally centered on just one thing. Ethics is out. There's SPs walking all over the place. <laughs> and just one SP, just one, all by his little lonesome, is blocking the entire Rhodesian situation, is knocking the British Empire crosswise, is costing fantastic quantities in trade, is showing up the vulnerability of England. And his name is Jackie Howman, Minister of Information, Tourism, and Immigration of Rhodesia. A real garden variety nut. <laughs> Every time they try to make a settlement, there's Howman. And he's got Smith 100% under his thumb. Smith's PTS. He's a rather weak man to begin with, but he's very PTS. Well, now, uh, the major threat to Scientology is that an atomic war or political takeover may occur <laughs> before we get uh, sufficiently well advanced that the organizations themselves are uh, able to uh, continue clearing human beings. Okay. That stands as an actual threat in the room. I had this in mind. I had other purposes in this. One of the purposes in mind is I, I wanted to see if Southern Africa couldn't serve as a security point and another avenue, the overseas, uh, that is to say, uh, U.S., British organizations. Uh, they might go right on and take the planet, but uh, if political uh, barriers or war prevented these organizations from uh, going ahead with their mission properly, then we at least had a base, you see, in southern Africa. Well, I was looking at that base and trying to make it secure and so on. It's just a second avenue. Now, the third avenue, of course, was OT base, the way I had it figured out originally. And now I found out what OT base would have to do. OT base would have to put in ethics on the planet. Because if you don't put in ethics, you're not going to get in tech. But there's one other thing that has to be put in, less important than ethics, but nevertheless very important. And that's economics. Man is running around with a bone in his nose on the subject of economics. <laughs> I hate to be snide, but as the Rhodesian looks at the stupidity of the African, I look at the stupidity of man. Only I can do something about it, and I'm trying. The laws of economics are plain, plain, plain. They're very elementary. It's a very elementary subject. A man just violates them all the time for some political advantage. He starves people, and he does this, and he does that, and slows up production, and so on. All kinds of reasons why. And he, they envelop, develops various kinds of economics. All ideological. You know, there's communist economics, and there's democratic economics, and there's socialist economics, and so forth. Here's all these economics, economics, economics. Actually, there's only one subject called economics, but it's become so obscured, so complex, and so kicked in the head by these ideological economics, 
that people have forgotten there is such a thing as real economics. Well, we have to be into economics because people wouldn't have enough to eat to sit still and wouldn't be able to pay for or uh, finance themselves for processing, except on a total subsidy. And I can assure you right now, you can't do it on a total subsidy. There is no contribution. On the moment there's no contribution, you won't find those cases moving. So there has to be some economic support on the planet in order to keep the economies moving so that organizations can flourish and expand because the economic systems being employed are uh, usable if modified. So therefore, OT base would also have this in view, ethics and to a small, tiny degree, economics. And then that would permit organizations to move forward and get in tech. Now, of course, you still have ethics inside tech. But you take a great big bite of ethics, like how are you going to solve problem between the United States and Russia? Oh, I think that takes just a little bit more than our ordinary ethics officer cares to bite off. <laughs> it's an ethics problem. But sometimes ethics requires economic assistance in order to get the problem solved. If you have a tremendous number of people who are starving to death, to try to get in ethics on them, you're not going to get very far. They're too distracted. They would rather shoot people. And uh, you can at least have ethics into the point of telling them who to shoot. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, out of all this, we have the purpose of OT base. And the one thing that is out, first and foremost, in the society, is ethics. That, brother, that is out. Every time you've tried to disseminate Scientology, you have run into ethics. And when you didn't solve ethics, you fell back for a loss. Right now, there is a situation right here in England, which we're solving by investigation, but which is an ethics problem. There are two or three blokes one or more of whom is an SP, who have suddenly decided to spend a fortune trying to cave in Scientology. Now, we're going to have to do something about those fellows. We better move fast because uh, it's all too slow. I mean, it's all too slow the way we've been going about it. We've got to make up for some lost time here. But these fellows do things like uh, uh, get your headquarters robbed of private research papers buy them off the thief, publish them out of context, and thus confuse the theory and research papers of Scientology with the actual practice of Scientology. And I point out to you that these are two entirely different things. Because I just reserved the right all the way along the line to write down whatever I found. But I did not put it out for unlimited circulation. You see? So they're challenging a fellow's right to make notes of what he's seen. But those research papers and books today actually do not much reflect the practice of Scientology, which if you look at it up the grades, has very, very reasonable and very comprehensible goals. Do you see? So what they're trying to do is bring about an identification of research papers out of context with an actual, very sober, very practical practice. Do you see that? And therefore knock you around with it. Well, unless we can get ethics in at this level, we ought to quit trying that, but we just better get these ethics in in a hurry. Nearly every human being on this planet that is in trouble is in trouble because ethics are out. Their lives are lives of misery. Just because of that. When you see three, five, ten million troops being killed in a war, they're being killed in a war just because there was an SP in some government nobody took out. And I think that's too many men to kill off just because there's one SP. 
It would only take one bullet, one beam, you know. <laughs> I don't say we would go into it on that level. I go right. <laughs> I had poor John McMasters. I had his. I had him. He wasn't worried. He wasn't flustered or anything like that. But he was just a little bit protesty, slightly, and so on. I was teasing him. I was saying I reserve the right to be able to tip over the White House. <laughs> and nobody was to tip over the White House but me. I was snarling about something that happened in America. <laughs> he naturally took me seriously. <laughs> and it disturbed him. It disturbed him. I had to point out to him, however, I was not yet clear. And therefore, I had a right to want to tip over the White House. <laughs> but what I didn't tell him is after the amount of trouble I was caused in 63 and so forth, I earned the right to tip over the White House. <laughs> Well, that probably wouldn't get in ethics unless you knew what SP was in the White House the time you tipped it over. But anyway. <laughs> but all joking aside, these situations resolve rather readily. We have the technology. We know exactly why this is out and that is out. We could actually go and sort out what are the key SPs in the situation on any international basis. We could sort them out. I don't say we'd do anything to them. We might just uh, be reasonable about it or so forth. Because now that's into technology at OT level, which, by the way, at this moment is relatively unexplored. But uh, that's OT base. Now, if you're going to appeal to the WOG world, you certainly better know the WOG world. So I learned all kinds of weird things. I, I learned, for instance, cell Scientology against an out ethics situation. Which was an interesting trick you want to try sometimes. You say to some person who is friendly to you, but who is a little bit uh, upset because of the bad things he has heard about Scientology. You say to this person, you say, uh, well, you've heard objections to Scientology. And you reach into your pocket and you whip out a problems of work. And you hand him the problems of work and you say, here, read that and find out what there is in it to be objected to. Go ahead, see if there's anything objectionable in that book. <laughs> One lady I did this with forgot to feed her family at 8 or 9 o'clock. <laughs> she should have served supper at 6. She was still reading. <laughs> so anyway, all kinds of data, all kinds of data accumulated. Uh, it was never more visible to me than that man needn't be in trouble at all. He needn't be in trouble. I don't care how many cross conflicts he has in his religions or political systems or anything else. It's just SPs. Some SP gets a hold of a political system and there we go. Some Stalin decides that the best possible thing to do is to kill off 10 million Georgians. That's the only way he can solve the problems of his country, is kill off 10 million Georgians. Of course, that's the act of a madman. And, of course, he was mad. But he was also very SP. Russia's just now staggeringly recovering from all it. They think this has something to do with communism. It has nothing to do with communism at all. The system called communism and so on, the system called socialism, the system called democracy and so on, all these could probably live cheek by jowl with just minor theoretical arguments. It isn't political systems anyway that make countries productive or people's happy. Political systems only exist because no one has solved the problem of succession of a good ruler. That's the problem a political system is trying to solve. You talk to a whole bunch of people and you say a benevolent monarch is a fine form of government if he is brilliant and runs his country well. And you'll find every political ideology, ideologist, will agree with you no matter what he is. And I'll say, that's true, and then they come right in on the back of it, but how would you succeed him? And then we get a political system. <laughs> so they can't guarantee that they can succeed him. You know, he can't have a successor. 
Well, the answer to it is don't have successors. Clearing. <laughs> now, where, where are, uh, difficulties lie individually, personally, at this moment? It's only because we haven't got ethics in, in the society around us. Any difficulty you're having as an individual is only because you haven't got ethics in, in your immediate environment. Now, we ought to shift gears on our emphasis. Now, we've been having a lot of fun, as I told you we would have much, much earlier. We've been having a lot of fun getting in ethics on Scientologists. We've had a ball. Boy, you've had enough comments to run out of your ear. You had enough ethics orders served on you and about you and chips and so forth and that sort of thing to last you quite a while. <laughs> and I hope in the process you've learned something about the ethics system. I also know that you wouldn't quite figure out how you'd get along without it. But it's a very handy thing to have. You can't actually, you can't possibly can remember when you didn't have any ethics system at all. How gruesome it was. Instructors, for instance, couldn't instruct. Auditors couldn't. Audit everything was a flap and a blow. The day of tea was somebody who chased students. <laughs> <laughs> but now, of course, where we have erred is getting ethics in too heavily on Scientologists and too lightly on the surrounding environment. Now we probably, we would be, that's fatal to do it reversed that way. That's, that's fatal. Too lightly on the environment around us, too heavily on Scientologists. Now what we ought to do is reverse that. And get ethics in, if anything, too heavily on the environment. <laughs> and err in the direction, but too lightly on Scientologists. You got it? Well, I'm sort of turning the cards on you in this talk. Because there isn't any point in getting ethics in on a willing person. He's perfectly willing. He's trying to do his job. So he's stupid. <laughs> <laughs> well, I assure you that it does no good whatsoever to get ethics in on somebody because he's stupid. <laughs> None whatsoever. It doesn't do, do a bit of good. <laughs> This kind of makes him sullen. <laughs> the purpose of ethics is to get out of the way willful mopery and dopery on the high seas. In other words, this guy intends to knock it apart. This guy intends to knock you down. You should upgrade your idea of what an SP is. Man, meet one sometime. A real one. A real monster. And of course him, you just, you just, uh, hanging around his neck, man. A real one. But a real SP is not just a difficult person. He's only about two and a half percent of the human race, and he's utterly nuts. And he is the guy who has been putting people in sanitariums and busting up lives, making nervous breakdowns, and that sort of thing. That's a real SP. When those show up inside Scientology groups and so forth, of course, shoot them. But you don't have somebody that's been around three years and has been doing quasi all right and has a lot of trouble with his mother-in-law turn up suddenly to be an SP. The SPs are real. They're real monsters. Now, uh, you ought to be up, upscale, upgrade your idea. What's an SP? What's he do? You know? Of course, you're probably a bit adrift on what they do do and what they look like and what they sound like. Well, one of the first things is this guy driven people into sanitarium. You know? This bird uh, strewing nothing but wreckage around him, whether material or personal wreckage. You know, I mean, you know, social wreckage, wrecking lives and families, and smashing things up in all directions. 
And is he willfully depressing the living daylights out of statistics and going all over the place? Well, in all the time we've been around here, we only had one SP that I know of. One, one real SP that was on staff. And he got the tech statistic right out through the bottom of the graph. He was denying everybody in the place auditing. And all the time he was protesting 100%. Now, whether he was SP or PTS, I have not made up my mind to this date because I haven't investigated the case enough. But we were certainly better off without that person. And I don't know of another single SP that we've ever had on staff. Isn't that interesting? See all these SP orders mean so much. Or you take an S and D. You take an S and D. Maybe the person is being suppressed by somebody else, but maybe it's the person merely makes them unhappy. He's not driving them into that frantic state. Find the real SP in the person's life. You know, a real one. Don't, don't throw it around carelessly. Because this is a very exaggerated condition, SP. They can look very nice. They can sound very nice. But actually, you can tell one about, usually tell one, a long way away. You hear the sounds of conflict, and you see the strewn wreckage long before you see the SP. Now, err by all means in getting ethics in on the environment outside Scientology. Err by all means in getting it in too heavily, because the only mistake you can make is getting it in too lightly. That's, that could be a bad error. It's the error we're making right now with this very tiny group that is dashing around the governments and trying to knock our heads in. That's the error we're making right now. We're getting in ethics too softly. Not fast enough, not hard enough. That is the mistake we're making. Well, we will go ahead and we will remedy that. I trust we are in time without causing another big kerfuffle, you see. But fast and hard. Now, out in the perimeter, outside Scientology, don't stand around and worry about whether or not you're going to make a mistake on what person or which. Don't worry about that. Just get ethics in. And then if you find out you've gotten it in wrongly, why, correct it. But get it in. But amongst Scientologists, why, you better be pretty careful. You better be pretty after all, the guy's perfectly willing. After all, he's with us. He's trying and so forth. That's why you saw me get a board of investigation in lieu of a committee of evidence. Now, of course, the board of investigation just was to find out the facts for Ron in a state of uh, confusion or upset. I didn't put in it that he should also find the facts out for Ron as to how come the affluence happened. I've got to rewrite that policy letter by adding that sentence to its purposes. But it's seldom ethics matter. Seldom an ethics matter that you really run into. Now, I know tomorrow you instructors and executives are going to be faced with a total revolt. <laughs> <laughs> well, all I invite you to do is uh, just raise your own ability to handle people. <laughs> Learn to be persuasive and uh, cajole and so on, because those are techniques too. Uh, if you think you got to like, send out an ethics order, like, send out an ethics order. But, uh, it's pretty serious, you know. It has an awful recoil. Anyway, but getting ethics in on the planet, the first grasp on that, oh, It'll probably be a gradient, but it better be a fairly steep gradient and better be done fast while we still got a planet. I don't like billiard balls. <laughs> now, how are we going to do this? Well, I couldn't tell you. Probably OT technology, but I can't tell you exactly what that is at this time. Because first I had to find out what we were trying to do. Well, you would just be surprised at how marvelous it was to find out that the organization could exist and continue 
and go on without me. That was great. That meant I really, really had built it up well. That was why I was then perfectly willing to stay away. But after I'd found that out was when I start, first started asking the question, how am I going to get out of here? I'm <laughs> popular. I have tremendous numbers of people depending on me now. How do I get out of here? Well, I got shot from guns, fortunately, in the time. And the other thing was, is could you make more clears? Wow. Wow. And made number 22 just to celebrate my coming home. <laughs> now, of course, I uh, have the immediate program of uh, polishing myself off, which I'm doing at a great rate of speed now. Everything's fine. I don't need any bits and pieces left around to experiment with in case you don't mention it. I found out, by the way, I found out, by the way, why people don't make it. Just nobody actually ran, sometimes didn't rehab, but mostly didn't run the release grades from zero on up to five. Sometimes they had the grade five processes and then should have gone back to grade zero and then gone up again, skipping grade five this time and gotten to grade six. Then you find out the case would run well. But cases that aren't running just aren't properly released on a grade. So that, that's the simplicity of that. No more, no more fancy material is needed. There wasn't any necessity to change anything around and uh, so on. So I'll just go on and finish it off. And then, of course, I start the real research, which is OT. And uh, we have quite a few volunteers in this particular <laughs> <laughs> And we've already had our first lesson. Already I've handed out the first piece of information. I had Reg and Jenny, and we were some... Uh, God awful airport or Wugga Wuggaville or something like that, <laughs> flying back. I was very fortunate. The only reason I could possibly get out of there in the time I did is because Reg and Jenny flew in on Wednesday. I only had three days or something like that. Reg and Jenny knocked all the baggies together and so forth and onto the airplane we went out. But anyway, <laughs> it's Wugga Wuggaville or some such place. We they started asking me questions about something or other, so I gave them a scale. And it's an OT scale. It has to do with knowledge and perception and so forth. It's a create scale, actually. And uh, when we reached London Airport, and all of you were waiting, patiently or otherwise, they stopped me and told me that I hadn't been vaccinated, so I had to be vaccinated. <laughs> but in the process, in the process of getting vaccinated, see, I'd already given them this idea of, uh, of, of the scale and so on. But in the process, this girl simply sat there with a line of about 50 people she was going to take care of before she sent me into the vaccination room to get vaccinated. She didn't sit there long. Reg put a beam on her and she went into the office. <laughs> Bang! She was kind of cross with me after her. <laughs> her self-determinism, if any, had been totally overwhelmed. <laughs> but uh, that shows you how dangerous it is. He'd had just a ten-minute lecture in one elementary scale, you see, on OT, and there went the vaccination clerk. <laughs> but uh, OT is something one moves up into it is not a state of clear and gradually all clears are starting to move forward and they move on up and they gradually develop this and that and they feel themselves getting a bit bigger and they start resolving some of the things that they're worried about you know about what's missed and so on <laughs> there are faster ways, however, to do this. There are faster ways, and we will find those faster ways. And when we found them, of course, why, then we can get ethics in very nicely, providing we have an OT base from which to get it in from. Now, I'm not sure whether the OT base is England, or the Middle East, or the mountains of the moon, or the moon. <laughs> 
I've studied it no further than that. I know what the society needs and know what the society responds to. I got my data. We're making clear. So organizations are functioning. They're very functional. Uh, life looks pretty smooth. The abilities of a being are, at this moment, only hinted at. And uh, so I have to go forward into all that. It's very interesting, by the way, that every time I try to put together the scope of OT, I have to take it off as a validation. <laughs> no matter what extravagant statements you make about an OT and the capabilities of it, it is an invalidation. Isn't that a wild thing? <laughs> well, anyway, I won't, uh, I won't tell you about this again. Usually old soldiers and people who've had campaigns of one kind or another sit around for ages and ages talking about how they were at Malta or this and that. And I won't do that to you. I won't keep saying, when I was in Rhodesia. <laughs> I uh, will just take it from here. It was so funny, though. It was so funny to get back and not really be back. You know, you shocked me in realizing where I was, you know, but I still think we're too bright and shining until... Bonwick took me around and showed me the place. And that was, you know, showed me what he'd been up to and what you've been doing and so on. And when we got that, <laughs> I came into PT and writing the reports, you see, about Rhodesia had been an awful chore ever since because uh, I laid it off. I said I would tell you about it. I'd write some reports about it. I've got to, got to submit some reports concerning it and so on. But to me, right now, it's not very interesting. I came up to present time. St. Hill looked awfully good. I think my, I'm much more interested, much more interested in beginning to get ethics in on those people we ought to be getting it in on with great speed so we can get. And maybe we've entered the first gradient. Maybe we get ethics in just on a simple gradient. It occurred to me the other day that we might be able to just get ethics in on the planet on a simple gradient, just like we're going right now with the technology and so forth. So, well, the first point of attack that we're making is one of the heaviest newspaper groups in the United Kingdom. Pretty fabulous. Now, anyway, there's my adventures in Rhodesia. <laughs> and the tale of a fellow who went out to conquer a country to find out what he needed in order to conquer a country. <laughs> and what application Scientology had on a planetary basis, and how and where and what to operate from. Got all those questions answered now. All I've got to do is polish myself up, get uh, uh, things lined up a little bit, and make the next move. You see, you just got through running me totally out of technology. <laughs> so anyway, I've got uh, a long job ahead of me still. And I'll still have to stick around. I can see that now. <laughs> And I'm sorry if that's bad news. <laughs> but uh, I apologize for not giving you all the lectures you have missed. I will try to make up for it in quality. In the <laughs> I've got me app jammed solidly around me ears. And uh, we've got an awful lot to do. But I want to thank you very much for keeping the show on the road, for making the clear, for making the affluences, and for keeping everything going while I was gone. And I'll do the same for you next time. <laughs> thank you.